Shall we start again? Oh, start again. Oh. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm still Anne Florini, Director of the Center on Asia and Globalization, and it is a very great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's presentation by Amory Lovins, who is somebody whose work I have been watching and admiring for quite a long time now. Um, for any of those of you who have followed energy issues over the last several decades, I think you will be familiar with Amory's reputation of being not only right, but right decades ahead of most other people. He was making projections about the possibility of decoupling economic growth and energy consumption um, as early as the early 1970s, if I recall correctly, um, long before anybody else believed that this was anything but a ridiculous idea to be laughed out of town. And as we have all seen since then, he was right about that and has been right about a number of other things since then. Um, to give you a brief introduction, Amory is a MacArthur Fellow and a consultant physicist. Um, he has won an extraordinary range of awards, the Alternative Nobel, the Onassis, Nissan, Shingo, and Mitchell Prizes, the Benjamin Franklin and Happold Medals, nine honorary doctorates, honorary membership of the American Institute of Architects, and the Heinz, Lindbergh, Jean Meyer, Time Hero for the Planet, and World Technology Awards. I think he is probably best known to most of us as the founder and co-head of the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a rather extraordinary organization in Colorado that has developed a very wide range of ideas on what we can actually do about energy, what we can do with technology, and a whole variety of ways in which we can save the planet. What he's going to talk to us about today is his latest book called Winning the Oil End Game. He'll speak for roughly an hour and leave a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers. Right. Well, thank you, Anne, and uh, thank you, Dean Kishore, and all of you who have made this meeting possible. <clears throat> I'm delighted to have the honor to bring some interesting news about oil, the obsolescence of oil. Uh, <clears throat> as set out in a study that we uh, published almost four years ago, uh, a business-based solution to the oil problem. There are probably 50 books on the oil problem. This is the only one I know that's a solution. And it was quite detailed and transparent and peer-reviewed. Nobody's arguing with it. <clears throat> uh, Co-sponsored by the Office of the U.S. Secretary of Defense and the uh, Chief of Naval Research, and written for business and military leaders, not for political leaders. They can hear about it later from their constituents in due course built around competitive strategy business cases for the car, heavy lorry, airplane, fuel, and military sectors. You can get the book free with all its backup at oilendgame.com. Uh, and it's a detailed roadmap for getting the United States completely off oil by the 2040s, led by business for profit and with a much stronger economy. Working in 50-odd countries and coming for a long time to Singapore, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work here as well. The U.S. transition beyond oil could look like this. Uh, oil use and oil imports, rather than heading towards the northeast corner as officially forecast, could be turned down along the green curves by redoubling the efficiency of using oil. We've already doubled it and more since the mid-70s. We can double it again. And that turns out to cost an average of 12 year 2000 US dollars per saved barrel, as I'll describe. We could then turn oil use and imports down more steeply along the blue curves by replacing the other half of the oil with a mixture of supply-side substitutions that's roughly three-fifths saved natural gas and two-fifths advanced biofuels, mainly cellulosic ethanol. <clears throat> More about that later. These have an average cost of just $18 a barrel because the saved gas is so cheap. Everything's cheaper on the margin than $26 oil. And uh, let's see, the average of half 12 and half 18, that's $15 a barrel, is the average cost of getting completely off oil. That's $100-odd less than we're paying for the stuff right now. We know that this sort of <clears throat> curve can happen because it happened once before. The last time we paid attention to oil from 1977 to 85, in those eight years, the U.S. gross domestic product grew 27%, but oil use went down 17%. Oil imports fell by half. Imports from the Persian Gulf fell 87%. 
and would have been gone in one more year if we'd continued. And so many countries saved so much oil so fast that it cut OPEX exports in half and broke their pricing power for a decade because we customers, particularly America, the Saudi Arabia of mega barrels, turned out to have more market power than the supply cartel because we could save oil faster than OPEC could conveniently sell less oil. Well, that was <clears throat> then, this is now, you are here. We could actually rerun that old play all over again, consider it just practice for what we really have now. But we could do a lot better. Suppose that we now invested 180 billion US dollars, half of it to retool the car, truck, and plane industries for tripled efficiency, as I'll describe, and half uh, to build a modern biofuels industry. And suppose that this were so successful in the US and abroad that the oil price crashed fourfold back to $26 a barrel in 2025, which was the official forecast for that year when we did the study. In that case, against $26 oil, $180 billion investment would yield a gross return of $155 billion a year, a very handsome net return of $70 billion a year. And it would cut the carbon emissions as a free byproduct by a quarter and give a million new jobs, mainly rural, and a million saved jobs, mainly in automaking. This all assumes, of course, the same rapid economic growth, the same lifestyles, the same amount of travel in the same size and performance of vehicles and so on, but safer. Um, compared to the federal forecast, we didn't change any of that. We didn't put people on bicycles or change settlement patterns. Uh, but the economic logic of substituting $15 getting off oil with whatever the price is to buy the stuff is so compelling that even at $26 oil, we found the same, uh, we found that this transition could be implemented without new fuel taxes, subsidies, mandates, national laws, or anything else that either US political party doesn't like or could botch. It isn't necessary to go to the great sausage factory in Washington for anything to, do, to get this done. There are some innovative public policies I'll mention later that would help it happen, um, although the main driver is still the private sector profit motive. But these public policies could actually be implemented administratively or at a state level without congressional action. And given the mess Congress is in, that's a good thing. In fact, w before this was published, I did a courtesy pre-brief on Capitol Hill to a meeting of senior staffers, both parties, both sides. And... Uh, Afterwards, there was a long pause, and then the senior Republican, they controlled both houses of Congress at the time, said, I'm really glad you're not coming up here to ask us to do something, because we would just mess it up. Well, we would do. There's an interesting bit of economic history behind the graph you just saw. It has to do with whaling, which was in 1850 the fifth biggest American industry, and most houses were lit by whale oil lamps. But as whales got shy and scarce, the price of whale oil started to drift up, the catch started to decline, and it turns out that in the nine years before Drake struck oil in Pennsylvania in 1859, over five-sixths of whale oil's lighting market went away to competitors to which the whalers had paid no attention, chiefly oil and gas made at the time from coal. This was long before electric light came from Edison. So the whalers were astounded to run out of customers before they ran out of whales because they hadn't paid any attention to the competition. The remnant whale populations were saved by technological innovators and profit-maximizing capitalists, and the whalers were soon reduced to begging for federal subsidies on national security grounds. Oil feels a bit like this today because we've spent decades amassing a very powerful portfolio, as you'll see, of ways to save or replace oil, but no one had bothered to add it up until we did in 2004. And then we found it was more than enough to replace all the oil we use at an eighth of its cost. The key technologically is, of course, transport, which in the U.S. case uses over two-thirds of the oil, there are similarly big saving opportunities in the, in the rest, the other 30% used in buildings and factories, mainly in feedstocks. But I want to focus here on transport because there's a common recipe 
for tripling the efficiency of cars, trucks, and planes without compromise and with improved safety by making them lightweight, more slippery in moving through the air and along the road, and giving them advanced propulsion. The cost of saving two-thirds of their fuel uh, is equivalent to buying petrol for 15 U.S. cents a liter, diesel for 7, and Jet A for 12. So at Singapore prices, the payback times would respectively be about one year, half a year, and two or three years. And often this comes with improved technical performance. For example, this Opel concept car, carbon fiber diesel hybrid, does 250 kilometers an hour if you can find a place to drive it that fast. It also does 40 kilometers per liter, although not at the same instant. And the light weighting that doubles the efficiency of these carbon fiber concept cars turns out not to increase their mass production cost because the costlier materials are paid for, as you'll see, by simpler automaking and a much smaller propulsion system. Of course, these technologies have continued to improve since we did the analysis four years ago. Uh, but let's just start with what we had then. And challenge the basic assumption among people who make cars or car policy that to make cars efficient, we have to make them uh, tiny, unsafe, sluggish, costly, and ugly, and you wouldn't really want to buy one. And then it's government job to, to get you to buy one anyway uh, by somehow compelling you to commit unnatural acts in the marketplace. Now, we don't think about consumer electronics in this way, do we? Uh, how many of you would still buy vinyl gramophone records rather than digital media? Maybe a few antiquarians in the crowd, but I think most of us recognize that, the, that our market expectations have been redefined by new technology. Or similarly, how many of us would buy a cathode ray tube television instead of a flat panel display? Probably not so many now. Now, if we apply the same leapfrogging to car engineering, then we do an end run around the 22-year gridlock that just started to break in Congress between whether to induce people to buy more efficient but compromised cars through fuel taxation or standards. And this would also give the automakers a much more robust business model because they would only need to worry about whether they make better and cheaper cars than their rivals and not about uh, random variables they cannot control like oil price and public policy. To understand how to do this magic, we just need to look at the physics of a typical car, which every day uses about 100 times its weight in ancient plants, very inefficiently converted to petrol. Where does that fuel energy go? Well, seven-eighths of it doesn't actually get to the wheels. It's wasted first in the engine, idling, driveline, and accessories. Of the one-eighth that does reach the wheels, half of that either heats the tires and road or heats the air that the car is pushing aside. And only the last 6% actually accelerates the car and then heats the brakes when you stop. But only a 20th of the mass you're accelerating is you. 1920th is the heavy steel car. So only 5% of that 6%, or 0.3% of the fuel energy, ends up moving the driver. After 120 odd years of devoted engineering effort, this is not very gratifying. However, there's good news. Three-fourths of the energy needed to move your car is caused by its weight, and every unit of energy we can save at the wheels will save an additional seven units we don't need to waste getting it to the wheels. So there's enormous leverage in making the car radically lighter weight, by far the most important thing you can do in car design. There are a lot of ways to do it. You can use aluminum. You can use ultralight steels. The strongest and lightest solution is carbon composites. That's what this handmade half million US dollar SLR McLaren is made of uh, from Mercedes. It happened to get T-boned by a Golf, which was totaled. But all that happened to the McLaren is it popped off a side panel, which they'll pop back on and fix the scratch later. Uh, now, if you were to look under the bonnet, you would find at the front corners a pair of three and a half kilogram crush cones made of carbon fiber that are so immensely strong that these two cones weighing altogether two-fifths of a percent as much as the car can absorb its entire crash energy running into a wall at 105 kilometers an hour uh, because these materials absorb six to 12 times as much crash energy per kilo as steel and do so more smoothly. This solves the safety conundrum of how do you 
feel driving in a very light car amidst heavy ones because with such light but strong materials that decouple size from weight, we can make cars that if we wish are big, which is protective and comfortable, without also making them heavy, which is hostile and inefficient. Therefore, we can save lives, oil, and money all at the same time. Uh, here's a 290 kilometer an hour crash that Catherine Legg is doing in the back here in something similar to a Formula One called a champ car. Um, and the car flies to bits as it's designed to do. When this bit fits, hits the fence, steel fence, look what happens to the fence. There is a person in here. It doesn't look very promising. However, and the best news is that Catherine Legg has walked out of the medical center under your own power. How are you feeling? Uh, a bit shaken, but I'm okay, as you can see. Oh, sorry. All my bits are intact, so it's good. It goes to show how strong the cars are. Where, where do you have some, some injuries? Oh, I just bang my knee. Car upside down. You, you bang your legs on the, the bulkhead and on the steering column and stuff. So just a bit of bruising, which uh, won't look too attractive in my dress in the Atlantic's banquet tonight. But. Yeah. And remember that uh, kinetic energy goes as the square of speed. She was going 290K, and her car was made of carbon fiber and epoxy, which is much more brittle and has only half the crash energy absorption of the thermoplastics that we would use for cars in series production. Uh, and they don't brittle fracture. They're very tough. Now, the problem with these <clears throat> materials, which I'll dwell on for the moment because they're less familiar than the valid metal solutions, is that they're conventionally considered very costly. Uh, when we use them in aerospace and military applications, that's at a thousand times lower volume and higher cost than you would need for mass-produced cars. But I started getting encouraged about bridging that gap when in the 90s I met a young engineer who just led the design at the Skunk Works where they do the not quite impossible military aircraft of an advanced tactical fighter that was 95% carbon, one-third lighter, but two-thirds cheaper because it was designed on a clean sheet to be made optimally out of carbon, not metal. Well, it was so weird, he couldn't find a military customer for it. So one bounce later, I was able to hire him to do the same thing for cars, which we did, teaming up with two uh, European uh, Tier 1 engineering houses. And uh, <clears throat> what we ended up with in, in the year 2000 was this uncompromised mid-sized suburban assault vehicle, which can handle five adults in comfort, two cubic meters of cargo, all a half ton up a 44% slope, if you can find one in Singapore. Uh, and it's actually less than half the weight of its steel equivalent, but safer even if they hit each other at a combined speed of 96 kilometers an hour. It has quite brisk acceleration, seven or eight seconds to get to 100K. And with a fuel cell on hydrogen, it would do 48 kilometers per liter equivalent, or with a petrol hybrid similar to a Prius, our train, it would do 28 kilometers per liter. Uh, that petrol hybrid version would have an extra sticker price of two and a half thousand US dollars pre-tax. Uh, and that extra cost is because it's a hybrid, not because it's ultralight. That part is free, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, so this would be a one-year payback at Singapore prices pre-tax. It can look like whatever you want. The particular design that my team did uh, is what was called in the trade a Gen X, Gen Y active outdoor lifestyle uh, uh, crossover vehicle at a time when crossovers were a gleam in the eye. But now there's a lot of stuff on the road that looks like this, so we feel rather flattered. Um, if you were to fold down the, the seats on one side rather than in the rear, you could put in two kayaks and two people. It's quite cavernous inside. You steer and control it with either, either a right or a left side stick, or if you're in Singapore, you put them on the right. Uh, virtual display, all functionality in software. Think of it like a computer with wheels, not a car with chips. Sony PlayStation 10, way cool, radically simplified. Uh, and we're starting to see things look a bit like this. For example, Toyota in October showed the 1X concept car, so-called because with the same interior volume as a Prius, it uses half the fuel and weighs a third as much. 420 kilograms total curb weight, 20 of which is extra batteries to make it a plug-in hybrid. Take that away, make it an ordinary hybrid. 400 kilos happens to be what I said in 1991, a good four-seat carbon car should weigh. Too much hilarity from the industry, as you can imagine. 
the flex fuel engine is only a half liter. It's so tiny it tucks under the rear seat. You can have a boot at each end if you want. No engine compartment. Uh, now, this might be dismissed as a mere technological boast, which mo most concept cars are. They don't get to market. Except that the previous day, the world's leading maker of carbon fiber, Torre, had announced a 30 billion yen factory in Nagoya to mass produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota, Nissan, and others. So this signals strategic intent, not amusement, and uh, is being appropriately so interpreted in the industry. Watch the space. Meanwhile, uh, companies that are very good at making cars out of metal are starting their own lightweighting revolution. Uh, Ford will roll one out starting 2012 to capture unexpectedly big uh, design synergies from lightweighting. Nissan has announced the same. And China, last December, set up a nationwide lightweighting alliance for its whole car industry, targeting a 300 kilo downweighting by 2010, which is practically tomorrow in the car business. So I think it's fair to say now that lightweighting, the most important way to save fuel in cars, is the hottest emerging strategic trend in the industry, and yet a lot of people haven't noticed it yet because it's just in the past few months that these things start to be announced. I mentioned that the SUV design would in mid-volume 50,000 a year cost nothing extra to produce, and here's why aside from, from general design for manufacturing and, and simplification. There are only 14 parts in the body, and they're actually suspended from rings like an airframe, making it immensely light and stiff. Rather than being built up from a tub, which is our horse and buggy legacy in the car business, each of these 14 parts can be lifted with one hand and no hoist, other than maybe the bit at the bottom. In fact, this largest part on the side, I can briefly lift with one finger. Uh, I don't think you could lift any of these parts uh, by hand with a steel car. And actually, the steel body would have not 14 parts, but 10 or 20 times that many. Each made not with one low-pressure die set, but with an average of four high-pressure progressive steel stamping die sets. So by having fewer dies and far fewer parts, we save about 99% of the tooling cost. And then these composite parts snap together precisely self-fixturing for bonding without needing the, rigs, the, the jigs and robots and welders of the conventional body shop. And if you want, you can lay color in the mold, and there's no paint shop either. Those are the two hardest and costliest stages in making a car. They just went away. So you save at least two-fifths of the capital compared with the leanest plant in the industry. I actually brought along a little Saudi Arabia that we discovered um, drilling in the Detroit formation. Well, there's a lot of oil under Detroit, uh, so to speak, in mega barrels. If we were to make U.S. cars and light trucks out of advanced composites, uh, we would save as much oil as the U.S. gets from Saudi Arabia. And in fact... Uh, as much as Saudi Arabia produced a few years ago. Over 8 million barrels a day. It's a big deal. So this is a, my, my carbon cap. It's a, a test piece for military helmets being shipped by a little firm that we spun off in 99 and I chaired till last year. And they've developed a technology for making advanced composite structures that scaled and matured can give you aerospace performance at automotive cost and speed. Uh, plastics have changed since that 60s firm, the gra uh, film The Graduate. Uh, this is actually tougher than titanium. You can beat it with the biggest sledgehammer you can find and not do any damage to it at all. It just bounces off. Uh, and uh, if you make cars out of it, half the weight and half the fuel use go away. It gets safer because this absorbs 12 times the crash energy per kilo of steel and it doesn't cost extra to make. Uh, there are, of course, perfectly valid light metal and ultralight steel solutions, and the market will sort out which materials win. In order to make the car so light, you don't just use light materials. You also have a different design process that organizes the people in a different way and maximizes what is called mass decompounding, the snowballing of weight savings. Uh, normally, if you save a kilo directly in a car, you really save about a kilo and a half when you get done, 
because you need less engine to accelerate it, less brakes to stop it, less suspension to hold it up, less structure, and so on. But you can increase this mass decompounding factor <clears throat> with a recursive design process. You start off making the car as light and slippery as you can think of, so you need less power to run it, so it's easier to use advanced propulsion technologies, <clears throat> and they get smaller, and so do the suspension brakes and so on. So that leaves more room uh, for the people, cargo, and crush space, which is good because you're light amongst heavies. But then it starts to look more expensive for all the obvious reasons until you go around the loop a few times. And as you do, parts don't just get smaller, they go away. In a good series hybrid, you no longer require transmission, clutch, flywheel, axles, differentials, drive shaft, universal joints, starter, alternator, they go away. So you get these nonlinear jumps in weight savings, which then compound further and make the thing lighter and lighter. This is the sort of design spiral we use in airplane design, in, in naval architecture, but it hasn't been seriously applied yet to non-racing automobiles, uh, except perhaps in our work. So we're, we're teaching that to the automakers. And another thing that we learned from the Skunk Works uh, <clears throat> is to design in the future. When, when the Soviets shot down Francis Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane, which had been developed at the Skunk Works, Kelly Johnson, the boss of the Skunk Works, did not say, I'm going to design a slightly better U-2. Rather, he said, I want to own the skies for decades, so I'm going to design a Blackbird. I don't know how, but we'll figure it out. Because he knew that design is like an elastic band. When you try to stretch it away from where it is now, you get more and more resistance, and ultimately it breaks. Whereas if you jump to the new design space you want to end up in, then with intelligent layers of risk management, you can stretch it back towards where you are now, wherever the technology isn't fully mature yet. But as the technology does ripen, it will relax back towards where you want to get to. If you don't do that, you'll never get the frog to leap. Uh, <clears throat> but it's a very effective method. Now, there are actually a few stages of the automotive revolution that go beyond what we analyzed in winning the oil endgame because of progress in the last four years. If you start with a good hybrid like a Prius and drive it properly, not the way people often suppose you should do, you'll roughly double your efficiency without diesels, uh, which would be even better. If you make it very light and slippery, you redouble its efficiency. Now you're using one-fourth the oil per kilometer that you started with. If you then fuel it with sustainably grown, decoupled from the food system, 85% uh, ethanol, for example, you save another three-fourths of the oil. Now you're using a sixteenth of what you started with. And by the way, you can pay farmers for taking... Uh, carbon out of the air and putting it back in tilth where it belongs. And then if you go to a good plug-in hybrid, or about that in a minute, you redouble the fuel efficiency again, and we figured out some interesting ways to pay for the, for the batteries. Uh, and again, more on that in a minute. It has some very interesting features. Well, so far, you've saved about 97% of the original oil per kilometer, and then you get to argue about uh, whether you want to go all the way to hydrogen to displace, for example, the biofuel, because it would make sense to make money with such efficient cars, and the market will sort out who wins. So this is actually the fuel cell design of our year 2000 SUV. Uh, because it's so light and slippery, it takes only a third the normal power to run it. So it can cruise on the motorway on the same power to the wheels that a normal car uses on a hot afternoon to run the air conditioner. This means that for a, a big normal driving range, 530 kilometers, you need only one-third the normal size of hydrogen tanks. So they're not impossibly bulky. They package well. There's plenty of room left for people and cargo, and you don't need the usually assumed breakthrough in hydrogen storage. Also, the fuel cell, this little thing with the X on it, it's three times smaller, so you can pay three times more per kilowatt for it. And on normal assumptions, that means you need 30-odd times less production volume uh, to get you down to a competitive cost for the fuel cells, which in turn will speed up the uh, adoption by a decade or two. So the first automaker to go ultralight is going to win the fuel cell race, the plug-in hybrid race, the battery electric car race. Any kind of advanced propulsion will benefit 
from great platform physics, making the car so light and slippery that you need only a third as much propulsion system because those tend to be rather dear. So we need only 35 kilowatts to run that revolution design, much less than competing ones that the industry's come up with. So whatever the fuel cell system ultimately costs, we'll pay a lot less for it because there's less of it, and yet we'll drive further. That's how important light weighting is. So if you were an automaker, you'd be smarter to spend your money making the car lighter rather than making the uh, tanks smaller or the fuel cell cheaper because you get to the same result with much less time, cost, and risk. Now, without anything exotic like fuel cells, you can probably get into the same or better efficiency range without them because of some new engine breakthroughs that are just emerging. For example, there's an Israeli mechanical genius in Colorado named Eddie Sturman who invented NASA's digital valves for rocket engines. And now he's applying those very fast, precise digital valves to the control of both fuel and air injection under closed-loop digital control, which lets you do quite unusual ways of running an engine uh, that are expected to be at least half again as efficient as a diesel, maybe much higher than that, burning any fuel on the fly. The engine would be more powerful, but smaller, lighter, and cheaper, and it would be very clean without any cleanup technology because of the precise control. Uh, that's already been demonstrated and is being refined pretty rapidly. Or there's an MIT innovation. If you inject the tiniest squirt of ethanol from a canister that will last several months into a normal internal combustion engine, you can triple the compression ratio without getting knock because of the evaporative cooling effect of the ethanol suppressing knock. And this means you can make the engine half the size and weight but on the order of a quarter to a third more efficient. And this would also stretch a limited ethanol supply to cover the whole fleet, using it much more effectively than simply as a bulk fuel. So there's a lot of interesting innovation coming at us. And then, of course, the, the biggest story here is electric traction, whether through batteries, fuel cells, plug-in hybrids, uh, especially if you make the car efficient to start with. And even if you ran it off coal-fired power plants, uh, you would emit less carbon per kilometer than we do right now, burning petrol. Uh, you could charge it with chief off-peak electricity, but then at the peak hours, you could use the batteries in the car as a portable storage device to sell power back to the grid when and where it's most valuable, like in the middle of the city on a hot afternoon. So the utility may even want to finance or own the batteries as a distributed storage resource. This also can add a new night market, which is not so important for Singapore, which will ultimately run on solar power in the daytime and with thermal storage, uh, solar electric at night. But it's very important in countries like the U.S. that have a lot of wind power potential, where the wind blows more at night than we need. Uh, of course, to make all this happen, we need a spark garage so that the car can converse intelligently with the utility to do uh, smart transactions back and forth through the building. So we're developing that now with industry. This is actually the utility think tank's vision of it. The plug-in hybrid would be just as much a part of the grid, exchanging electricity both ways, as the distributed generation, whether renewable or not, uh, and smart end use devices, all communicating intelligently with the grid. And in California, for example, we have this sort of daily electric load shape. If you had 5 million plug-in hybrid vehicles running at night, they would soak up this much extra nighttime electricity. You wouldn't need to build more power plants. We've already got those. You wouldn't need more grid. Uh, but then in the daytime, at the peak times when the utility is struggling to meet demand, you could sell that power back to the grid and shave off this peak. That's immensely valuable. At those times, the utility will pay you dollars per kilowatt hour. Cars are parked about 96% of the time in the U.S., usually in habitual places. And it turns out that a very efficient fleet of plug-in hybrid or fuel cell light vehicles in the U.S. would have 6 to 12 times as much generating capacity as is already on the grid. So it doesn't take many people using their cars as plug-in power stations on wheels to displace all the conventional power plants. And in fact, the two, first two million American drivers to do that will earn back the entire cost of the car. After that, it gets a bit less lucrative, but still very attractive. This is a new 
kind of value proposition. You know, you're, you're sitting at your desk and your previously idle second biggest household asset instead of just sitting there eating interest actually is a profit center selling power back to the grid. Not a bad deal. Um, so this is rather important. And actually, we've just done another spinoff, our fifth one, uh, in January to exploit some new ideas we have about plug-in hybrids. Also, it turns out in the U.S. this extra night market, if we had a half plug-in hybrid fleet, uh, would let us build an extra 230 gigawatts of wind power, and then those wind turbines would run all whenever the wind's blowing, and annually they would produce more electricity than all our coal plants now make, and over half our electricity is now produced from coal. This is another very good thing for climate. Now, I shan't bore you with the details of the aeronautic analysis. But suffice it to say that, that our calculations, working with Boeing and others, of what can be done um, very well fits both industry and academic uh, analyses. And basically, you can double the efficiency of a jetliner with a conventional tube and wing configuration, or you can triple it if you make it a blended wing body, which looks a bit like a flying wing, uh, with very good economics. Uh, and then you can go actually to a factor five or six total improvement if you fuel it with hydrogen with what's called a, a cryoplane. That's been quite well worked out and turns out to be economically at least to break even against oil and safer than kerosene, uh, but we didn't assume it. Now, if you go through all of the sectors where we look carefully at what can be done with oil efficiency, and then you look at how many dollars you pay or save uh, to save a barrel. It works out that you save a bit over half the oil when you get it all done at an average US dollar cost of $12 a barrel. Now, were we to, and by the way, this is in 2025, but you couldn't actually get it all done by then without quite dramatic speed up of the fleet turnovers. It would take couple of decades longer to get it all done. But this is with no new technology. It doesn't include some of the stuff I've just described to you. And it's you notice twice the saving that you would get from conventional wisdom technologies like National Academies typically talk about, stuff that's 20 years old. And uh, Using that old technology, uh, not highly integrated designs, you could save about a quarter of the oil at an average cost of $6 a barrel. But then getting rid of the other three quarters of the oil on the supply side would cost too much. So it's a much better deal to save half through efficiency and only have to back out the other half through replacement supplies. Now, on the supply side, <clears throat> uh, about three-fifths of the substitution we would do is actually with saved natural gas. And even though you don't have uh, heating loads here, just a little uh, water, a tiny bit of water heating and, and uh, a lot of industrial process heat. Uh, in most of the world, there is a huge potential to save gas, and there is here too, especially by saving electricity, which you're making 80% from gas in your combined cycle plants. Now, in the US, we actually do our peak electricity with simple cycle combustion turbines, so dreadfully inefficient that if you save 1% of the electricity, including peak hours, you thereby save 2% of total gas use and cut its price 3 or 4%. Huge leverage to save gas. So actually, two-thirds of the gas saving shown in green that we can use to cut in half the projected gas use at an average cost under a dollar a gigajoule, a tenth of its recent price, two-thirds of that is from saving electricity. And Singapore certainly has that potential, uh, as well as uh, a lot of industrial gas savings. And then on the biofuel side, I'm not talking about maize ethanol or palm oil biodiesel. These are, uh, well, the maize ethanol particularly is a slow, uh, a very costly, rather small, heavily subsidized resource. It, it doesn't go without subsidies even at the old maize prices. But if you make ethanol instead or other fuels like butanol out of woody, weedy materials, switchgrass, elephant grass, uh, logging wastes, crop wastes, municipal wastes. It turns out that you get over twice the yield with less capital investment and up to eight times better net energy yield. 
So this turns out to be a rather large, cheaper source based on pilot plant results that have since been further extended and shown this to be reasonable or conservative. And there's a bit less left over to make materials to displace petrochemicals. Just to illustrate the gradual maturation of the biofuel business, Brazil has replaced over a quarter of its petrol with sugarcane ethanol, which is now competitive without subsidy. Um, they're excluded from the U.S. market by an illegal 100% tariff to protect the maize farmers. WTO, I expect, will make that go away pretty quickly. Um, Sweden published a very good policy for getting completely off oil by 2020, and then a different government came in and said, okay, we'll do the same thing 10 years later. Uh, but um, that's based, mainly based on logging wastes. Uh, Europe is a huge producer of biodiesel, over half of it sold as a branded product by oil companies, the rest mainly in hypermarkets, and it's part of a rational policy to shift farmers from temporary subsidies to durable revenues. In Southeast Asia, there's an extremely promising new development with, uh, with sugar palm, not to be confused with palm oil. It uh, requires low-cost labor, such as you have a lot of, say, in Indonesia, uh, or Malaysia, to harvest it. It's a rather labor-intensive process, that's a good thing for those countries' development needs. And it actually does not grow in plantations. It requires a diverse forest to flourish. So that's very good for preserving forest biodiversity. And it's an extraordinarily high yielder. I just saw some of this work in East Kalimantan uh, last week. And it's, it's quite astonishing. Now, in the US case, here's how the moving parts fit together. In 2025, Rather than needing the officially forecast 28 million barrels a day of petroleum products, we could get rid of almost eight of that by then and still be in the process of turning over the vehicle fleets to save the last seven uh, of, uh, through, through efficiency at $12 a barrel average cost. We could get almost six from biofuels and the like, almost two from no-brainer substitutions of saved natural gas that make sense at any relative price, there's almost eight of projected domestic output from areas already allowed. And we need to get five from someplace else, which is a lot better than what we started with. Well, where could we get that? Well, maybe we should buy more efficiency. It's so cheap, and we're finding more of it all the time. Or just wait a little longer and get the rest of it. Or we could continue to import oil from Canada and Mexico, or import Brazilian <laughs> ethanol once our illegal tariff goes away. Oh, I've not yet accounted for two-thirds of the saved natural gas. I only used less than a third of it over here. The rest of it is enough to meet this balance term, directly substituting for oil. Or if you want to make the most money from the saved natural gas, then you'll make it into hydrogen, which is so much more efficiently usable in fuel cells that you could also displace the domestic oil. And I'm not counting here other options, like just in North and South Dakota, we have enough wind power potential to make cost-effectively by then as much hydrogen as the world makes today. And that would be enough at these levels of efficiency to run every highway vehicle in the United States. So it's actually rather a large menu. And I'm not counting other things like algal oils that are looking very promising. Now, in the second half of winning the oil endgame, we analyzed some public policies that could help all this happen faster with higher confidence and less risk. And the most powerful thing we found for light vehicles would go very well in Singapore, and it's called a fee bait. Uh, it's a cross between a fee and a rebate. When you go to the dealer to buy a car of the size you want, there are different models on offer with varying efficiencies. But we would charge a fee on the less efficient models and use that money to pay a rebate on the more efficient models, and thereby in a revenue neutral fashion within each size class, we would broaden the price spread between them so as to arbitrage the spread in discount rate between private and societal. And therefore, your private purchasing decision would be the correct one for society. You would look at the full, say, 14 years worth of fuel savings, not just the first year or two. Now, the automakers will naturally want to shift their models from the fee zone into the rebate zone by making them more efficient. That's 90-odd percent of the effect of this policy. It turns out that to do that, they add technology content that has a higher profit margin than the rest of the vehicle. So they make more money this way. They're starting to get quite interested in that. We have in the United States a problem you don't, I think, have here, 
where with, without good public transport, many of our low-income citizens cannot afford to get to work when petrol prices go up. But we've came, come up with some financial engineering to solve that problem in a way that creates a new million-car million car year market from previously non-creditworthy customers. So the automakers like that. Fleet procurement <clears throat> could be done a lot better in both our countries. That is, government at all levels buys a lot of non-tactical vehicles. And if you buy just the, say, 5 or 10% most efficient models on the market meeting your requirements, that would drag more of them into the market at higher volume and lower cost. There are other methods of reducing manufacturers' risk and rewarding innovation as well. What we call the platinum carrot is, is now being implemented as the automotive X prize. In the case of heavy lorries, it was a different problem. When our MBAs brought in the spreadsheet saying you can get a 60% internal rate of return at the old oil prices on a triple deficiency heavy lorry, I was rather puzzled this hadn't been done already because the hauling firms are, are smart and competitive. And I thought, hmm, maybe they don't know they can do this. That's been known to happen. So I rang up the heads of large companies we deal with who buy each maybe 1% of the national heavy lorry fleet and said, did you know you could triple your efficiency? with a handsome return. They said, no, that's interesting. The, the maker said we could save maybe a tenth of the fuel and it would cost a lot. How do you save two-thirds? So I told them, and they said, well, that doesn't sound so hard. I'll tell you what, let's build one and test it. And if it does what you say, we'll tell them that's what we want. And of course, the right answer. So we started facilitating conversations between one such firm and its suppliers, and they figured out within hours that the first 25% saving is free. Ooh, why didn't you ask? And then the buyer said, free is not good enough. I want to invest for a return. What can you do for me? And now they're arguing about uh, whether they'll get doubled or tripled efficiency and how quickly. Uh, well, it turns out that this will, the company is named Walmart. It's the world's largest corporation. So they will make billions of US dollars net present value on this deal. Uh, they're highly motivated. The supply chain stepped up magnificently, and now we're working to, to broaden the buyer's consortium and speed up the innovation further. But we're using their demand pull to drag double deficiency trucks into the market. Walmart has demanded those of its suppliers and will roll them into its fleet by 2015. Then everybody will be able to buy them. That will save 6% of U.S. oil, which is, by the way, over three times what the Pentagon uses for everything. Now, in the case of airlines, it's a different problem again. Unlike Singapore, we've got some very badly managed airlines, half of which are bankrupt. So they can't afford the new planes they need to dig out of their cost hole. Now, if you wanted to help them do that, which you might or might not philosophically, uh, we figured out a way to do that through government loan guarantees, specifically to buy efficient new planes, but offset by equity warrants so there's no net cost to Treasury. And on condition that for each plane so financed, we will scrap one of the inefficient old planes parked in the desert so they'll never fly again. Because if they went back in the air, you know, the worst fifth of the fleet is parked. If they went back in the air, this would waste more oil and block the adoption and development of more efficient planes. So the inefficient old ones are worth more dead than alive. We should take them out back and shoot them. And as you can imagine, uh, Boeing really likes this idea. We have a very powerful new ally in this work, and that's uh, the Department of Defense, uh, <clears throat> which has extraordinary costs in blood and treasure for delivering fuel. Uh, half the casualties in theater now are caused or, or are associated with convoys. 70% of the tonnage they haul is fuel, which is mostly wasted, because when designing um, and acquiring the platforms that use the fuel, it was assumed that fuel delivery is free and invulnerable. This is a very, very bad approximation. But now we've got the policy changed so that uh, future acquisition and analysis will be based on what's called fully burdened cost of fuel delivered to platform in theater in wartime. That means we're going to be valuing, say, fuel one or two orders of magnitude more than before. 10 or 100 odd times more than before, which means that the prime contractors who own the system politically will be competing over who can make the most efficient platforms. Now, the result of this in turn will be that the very powerful science and technology engine of the military, which in the past has given us things like the internet, the global positioning system, the jet engine industry, and the microchip industry, 
will be driving R&D in things like advanced ultralight materials and manufacturing and propulsion and design integration, which will then speed up the tripled efficiency civilian cars, trucks, and planes that will save 60-odd times as much oil as the military will save directly. Uh, that's huge leverage, and of course it's not just in the U.S., it's also abroad. Now in Singapore, where you're particularly good at this military tech transfer, I think this is a remarkable opportunity. Uh, in fact, uh, it's, as I'll mention later, I think Singapore could become rapidly a world leader in this kind of work, uh, as both for the home market and for export. And uh, the result, of course, will be that the warfighters will become much more capable, but less needed, because we shan't be fighting over oil Oil will become like salt. You know, there was a time when countries went to war over salt before we had refrigeration. It was how you preserve food. But now you put a bit of salt on your food and you don't think about where this commodity comes from. It's not important. And oil, likewise, can become quite unimportant. So we can have mega missions in the Persian Gulf, mission unnecessary. And as you can imagine, the warfighters really like that idea. There are also ways in countries like mine that have big car industries to speed up their transition without net cost to treasury and to accelerate the transition from hydrocarbons to carbohydrates and get out of our own way in other respects. But you'll find all that written up in the second half of the book. And we found that using a, a model that matches the government models within a few percent, uh, that suite of policies would let us leapfrog rapidly over today's inefficient cars and over incrementally improved cars to triple efficiency ones uh, with enormous savings in oil and money. And this is at $26 a barrel. Now, big changes have happened surprisingly quickly before. In the 1920s, it took the U.S. auto industry just six years to switch from wood to steel auto bodies. At the start of World War II, it took only six months to switch over from making cars to making the material that won the war. When the U.S. last paid attention to oil, oil intensity dropped 5% a year. Car efficiency improved almost 5% a year. It was like getting rid of a gulf's worth of imports every two and a half years. Boeing uh, has transformed a very complex and highly regulated product, as I'll summarize in a moment, in just five years. GM, another very large organization, had a small team take its EV-1 battery car from launch to street in three years. Normally, it takes about 12 to 15 years for those S-shaped diffusion curves to go from about 10 to 90 percent adoption in the stock. But our models are showing that you can speed up the takeoff point by several years and then greatly steepen the adoption curve through the kinds of supportive policies I, I, just, I summarized, whose purpose is to support and not distort the business logic on the, on the philosophy the government should steer, not row, but should steer in the right direction. By the way, lest you wonder why the military is so interested in this, here's a little petting zoo uh, that I assembled from briefs to our Defense Science Board uh, panel that just reported 13 February. If you want to see the report, Google more fight, comma, less fuel, and it's on the Defense Science Board website. And you know, I'm describing here what each of the platforms is, what it does in performance, and what it does in fuel savings, like five to nine-fold fuel savings with heavy fixed wing, 97% fuel saving for this airplane, 25 to 40% with lower cost and less maintenance in engines. How about a helicopter that does vertical insertion for mounted maneuver over three times the previous range at three times the speed with a sixth of fuel? These are revolutionary capabilities. Uh, or how about this replacement for an up-armored Humvee? Um, I believe the unofficial numbers are a third the weight, a fifth the fuel, and an eighth the acceleration time for very much better protection than anything made today. And by the way, it costs less. Uh, or how about this one? At the moment, Allied forces have a lot of um, generator sets, gen sets, that are using a third of the U.S. Army's wartime fuel. 95% typically of that electricity runs inefficient air conditioners to cool dark-colored, uninsulated tents in the blazing desert. 
So we're getting people blown up in fuel convoys to bring the fuel to the gensets for this purpose. What's wrong with this picture? You can see why we've got marine generals in Iraq begging for efficiency and renewables to untether them from oil so they can do their jobs. So anyway, it's a rather attractive set of technologies. And now imagine these back to the civilian sector, and you see why I get excited about it. I want to also to give an important private sector story. Boeing was in as deep trouble a decade ago as the American car industry is today. So they got costs back under control with Toyota production system at Boeing commercial airplanes. A lot of wrenching changes, but there wasn't a lot of really exciting innovation in the pipeline. And Airbus was pulling ahead, and some people were starting to doubt Boeing's staying power. Well, Boeing's bold riposte was the Dreamliner saving a fifth of the fuel at no extra cost, half carbon composites by weight, up from 9% in the previous 777, many advantages to the user and the manufacturer, and they're approaching their thousandth order. It sold out well into 2017. It's the fastest order takeoff of any jet in history. And now they're rolling out that suite of innovations to every airplane they make before Airbus can steer itself out of the ditch. So think about what this has done going from Boeing on the ropes to Boeing way ahead in three years. Now, to be sure, there are glitches in manufacturing, not to do with the composites, but with things like wiring and fasteners. That'll get sorted, and, and it'll be on, on, you know, in the sky next year. But um, what they've done here is a breakthrough competitive strategy based on a leapfrog in platform efficiency, based on advanced ultralight materials, manufacturing, design integration, and propulsion. Well, at our little institute, we're busy implementing the oil end game through institutional acupuncture. That is, we figure out where the business logic is congested and not flowing properly and stick needles in carefully selected sites to get that chi flowing again. Uh, and we need to shift six sectors' behavior. Well, we don't need to do much in aviation. Boeing's got that well in hand. And of course, competition is good, so we work with others as well. I've already told you the heavy lorry story and the military story. In the fuel business, there's enormously rapid progress in uh, much cheaper and very benign biofuels that are completely unrelated to the food system, like cellulosic ethanol, but also others. Uh, it was very stupid to link the food and fuel systems in the first place, and they ought to be unlinked as quickly as possible. But uh, actually, we found in the US case that the vehicle fleet could be run on advanced biofuels uh, without requiring any cropland or irrigation or other ag inputs without competing in any way with food production. Finance put $117 billion of private risk capital into the clean energy space worldwide last year, growing very rapidly. And we always knew the hardest sector to shift would be light vehicles. But when I suggested in winning the oil end game that Detroit should do what Boeing had done, some outside directors of Ford Motor Company read that, thought it was a good idea, and went out and recruited the head of Boeing Commercial Airplanes to run Ford. So he's now there with transformational intent. It's getting quite exciting. The union and the dealers are quite keen for this kind of basic innovation to save their industry as a tsunami of creative destruction sweeps over them, accelerated by leapfroggers like Tata in India with the new nano $2,500 US dollar car. I keep threatening that Singapore is going to get into the car market, so please make that happen, will you? Uh, competition is good. And also, we're helping the industry understand why fee baits will be to their advantage. So basically, the competition now, technological and commercial, uh, in the car business is at a pace we haven't seen since the 1920s, and it's changing the managers or their minds, whichever comes first. Uh, two of the big three U.S. automakers are now run by non-car guys, which would have been inconceivable a few years ago. It's a very interesting time. Last summer, our institute led two transformational projects with, it, with industry, uh, either of which could flip the whole thing, and they both turned up trumps. So we're very pleased with how this is going. Here's what it means for oil worldwide. If you look at how many trillion barrels you could extract, sorry, at what free market price, that is without an OPEC monopoly rent, 
We've already taken out a trillion barrels, and OPEC Middle East countries say they've got another trillion, which would be about what the world needs to 2030, but who wants to buy everything from them? So we're getting into costlier conventional and frontier and heavy oil, experimenting with oil shales, dreaming about cold liquids. Except you notice this conventional supply curve, in this case using BP data, does not include anything in winning the oil endgame. It doesn't include end use efficiency or advanced biofuels or safe natural gas substitution. If we conservatively scale those from the US to the world and splice them in in green, everything shifts three trillion barrels to the right. And that's, that means you never get to the stuff at the upper right corner. That's good because it's extremely carbon intensive as well as costly. So the cumulative carbon emissions, if you stopped here, let's say, instead of getting up to here, would be at least a trillion tons of carbon lower, and you'd save tens of trillions of US dollars doing it, plus whatever monopoly rent you would have paid to OPEC. Now, you'll notice I have not mentioned the magic words peak oil, the debate about when will world oil output peak and start down if it hasn't already. That's because nobody can know who's right about it. 94 or so percent of world reserves are held not by auditable public oil companies, but by governments and parastatals, which either don't know or won't honestly tell you what they've got in the ground. But it doesn't matter who's right about how much oil is in the ground, because we should do exactly the same things anyway to save money, to save carbon, and to improve security. Those are three unarguable reasons for getting off oil. I don't need a fourth indeterminate reason. So I, th I think this is a bit of a distraction. Here's an amusing history of world oil consumption versus price using Saudi-like market crude. Start back here in 1970. Demand grew rapidly in low prices. Price shot up in 73. Demand grew slower to 79 when the Shah fell. Then price went up even more. In fact, so much the demand went down in a glutted market. And the price crashed. It was somewhat revived briefly by the uh, invasion of Kuwait, but it kept wandering around. And then came 9-11, and then came the invasion of Iraq. And at the moment, it's up around here, all-time high in real price, which, you know, even though we're much less oil dependent than now, you think maybe it's ready for another loop-the-loop -loop with the new technologies we didn't have then? It kind of looks that way. I think the biggest threat to U.S. national energy security is national energy policy. Uh, which perpetuates oil dependence. That's bad for everybody. And actually, the Iranian treasury was broke, and President Bush conveniently bailed them out, and the Saudis were almost broke, and he bailed them out too. So Ahmadinejad and Chavez and Putin are you know, on the U.S. payroll in an interesting sense. Uh, and this is the first time my country has ever funded both sides of a war. Uh, warping, as Secretary Rice says, our foreign policy and... Uh, weakening our competitiveness, making the economy more vulnerable, more fragile. Not a great idea. But also, U.S. energy policy strongly favors over-centralized system architecture. I wrote in 81 for the Pentagon the definitive unclassified study of domestic energy vulnerability. It's on our website, rmi.org, and it's called Brittle Power Energy Strategy for National Security. I pointed out that at that time, and it's only got worse since then, uh, a handful of people could turn off three-quarters of the oil and gas to the eastern United States in one evening without leaving Louisiana. Sorry if Hurricane Katrina read that. The electric grid is worse than that, and the things the federal government is doing about regional blackouts will make them worse. The U.S. policy also is to create fat new terrorist targets, often near our cities. Uh, and, in fact, the centerpiece of U.S. policy is still, at least in the White House, to create a new all-American Strait of Hormuz on the north slope of Alaska, a new choke point, more vulnerable than anything else we've got. Well, one Strait of Hormuz was quite enough, thank you very much. Uh, and since the president has correctly identified nuclear proliferation as the gravest threat to U.S. security, it's very puzzling that he keeps encouraging proliferation every way he can think of. So, as I say, when briefing this to the military staff colleges, if these are not the national security outcomes you want, it's your duty as military professionals to say so. And they're starting to say so to good effect. Now, Singapore is clearly sitting on a gold mine of megabarrels and megawatts. 
I think it's based on work in you know 50 odd countries and being here a long time. I, I find it hard to imagine you couldn't save at least three quarters of your electricity and, and uh, two thirds of your oil very profitably over the next few decades. Now you do have a world leading policy of charging more or less the full social cost, whatever that is, of driving. So drivers not only get what they pay for, but pay for what they get. American drivers definitely don't do that. We have corporate socialism for cars and free enterprise for everyone else. But imagine now that you add on to your good public transport and its further improvement and even further innovation in those vehicles. You add super efficient cars and other vehicles. And those could be very well made in Singapore. Remember, to make hypercars like I described, you don't need a steel industry. What you need is advanced materials and manufacturing, computer-aided design and manufacturing, aerospace and marine and military industries, power electronics, microelectronics, software and system integration. You're among the best at all those things. So what are we waiting for? Now, as traction goes more electric, then it becomes relevant that a modernized and resilient power sector that is more efficient, diverse, dispersed, renewable should actually cost less than the fossil fueled one you've got and emit no carbon. Your container port and airline can also continue to lead technological shifts that could go to several fold further efficiency improvements. Basically, Singapore is uniquely equipped in many respects to help lead not just the region but the world off oil and to set a superb example for China. So I'm very excited by this prospect. And if anything, I've said in how we are the people we've been waiting for, it seems too good to be true. Just remember this nice remark of Marshall McLuhan that only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. Thank you very much. It's your move. I'm sure I said nothing controversial, but let's see. Oh, no, nothing controversial at all. Thank you very much, Amory. Um, I'm, we only have a few minutes left for questions, um, and I'm going to throw it open to the audience in just a second. But I'm going to start with the obvious one coming from a school of public policy. Why are the policies so backwards? How much of this is ingrained interest of special interest, and how easy is it actually going to be to overcome those interests? How strong are the economic incentives that you were pointing to? Well. The oil industry, which might come first to mind, uh, is split down the middle, or actually, I'd say more on the good side at this point. Um, and actually, I, I had an interesting experience um, with uh, a very good guy, an ex-Marine, who leads the Washington operations for a very large and well-known and not very progressive oil company. And uh, he said some nice things about our study on the record in front of the Washington Post business reporter that he didn't need to say, so I got intrigued and accepted his, his invitation to go talk to their strategic planners. And uh, it turned out that their engineers had already come to the same conclusions. It was only their economic forecasters who didn't get it, so I left them arguing with each other. Uh, the economic paradigm has a lot of strengths and values, but it's not at all complete. And it's particularly bad in general at looking at leapfrogs in technology, integrative design, and business strategy. Those are the three real drivers here. It, we're used to thinking that the oil problem can only be solved by possibly draconian or politically unacceptable public policy, chiefly implemented through pricing instruments. That's a very cramped, impoverished uh, uh, slate of options to deal with. And I think it's being way overtaken uh, by the design, technology, and strategic uh, business strategy innovations. Also, there is a certain native conservatism that the whalers must have felt. You know, we, we sell lots of whale oil. We'll go on selling lots of whale oil. And it, it won't all fall in on them in a few years as it did with whale oil because it takes so long to turn over the fleets. But uh, it's a little sign of the times that in the United States last year, the Prius outsold the Ford Explorer, which for 10 years was the top selling sports utility vehicle. And just in the last month or two, for the first time, compact and subcompact cars are outselling SUVs. 
Uh, in government, we have a particular set of ingrained ideological interests that are especially gridlocked in the U.S. We don't have the degree of relative coherence you have in Singapore government. Um, so if I actually want to get things done, of course, I will work with the private sector in its co-evolution with civil society, and I will not spend much time in Washington except perhaps with the Pentagon, because that's an effective institution for all its faults. Um, the car industry is starting to get it, and actually, having invented hypercars in 91, I open sourced the concept in, 90, in 93, kind of like Linux software, uh, so that nobody could patent it, and everybody would be fighting to exploit its commercial advantages before their rivals did. This turned out to be very effective. Up till that time, we'd spent about $3 million U.S. of, of R&D funds on it from grants and donations. And over the next seven years, the industry committed about $10 billion to this line of development, giving us over 3,000 full leverage. Can we open now for questions? Sir. No, it's on the record. My name is Maciej, and I'm doing my, my master's here. I have a question regarding the uh, demand side of your analysis. Um, how energy intensive and carbon intensive are these lightweight materials? Oh, to make? Yes. Um, the life cycle analysis, which we've done in detail, is very favorable, uh, both directly and indirectly. Indirectly, of course, is what really matters, because if you've got uh, hydrocarbon or carbohydrate molecules, it's much better to invest them in an ultralight, durable structure that doesn't dent, rust, or fatigue uh, and is very recyclable when, you, when you're done with it than to um, burn it to propel a bunch of steel. <laughs> uh, typically, carbon fiber is made of polyacrylic nitrile. It's a white orlon-like fiber that's then carbonized in controlled atmosphere to make half as much black fiber. Polyacrylonitrile is made of propane, but it could be made of carbohydrates instead. You know, it's a small molecule, easy to do. And uh, it turns out the quantities are not very large. There's only tens of kilos in each car because it's so strong. So if every car were a hypercar and they didn't uh, get recycled and they d you didn't give them credit for their longer life, again, they don't rust or fatigue, uh, then the, um, the carbon fiber production would go up by t about a hundredfold, but the amount of polymer production would go up at most by one or two years' worth of normal industry growth. And the amount of polymer, mass of polymer in each car would be about the same. It would just shift from low to high value polymers. We, we did actually a detailed two-volume, 26-sector technology assessment before we embarked on this whole adventure just to resolve exactly those kinds of questions. Um, Marin Asa from the Lee Kuan Yew School. Um, you've talked about leapfrogging, and you've talked about how quickly we've made um, energy efficiency switches in the past, but um, you've mentioned yourself that the car industry is a bit different, and that's maybe because of the the market mechanisms and how um, you know what kind of image um, the customer gets from from the industry. Um, do you think this is because there's this is an extreme case of ne network externalities? Do I think what? Network externalities. Uh, you know, when you use an existing technology, we've used it for so long that there's the whole system is so strongly entrenched. Well, um, uh, I mean, outside Singapore, there are very few countries that charge anywhere near the full social cost of driving. Although, right. I guess if you laid all the economists end to end, they would never reach a conclusion about what that number is. But it might be a good thing. Um, anyway, the. <coughs> I think what you're up against is not so much the, and, uh, the price distortion as ingrained ways of doing things in an extremely complex, ponderous industry. I mean, we make, what, a couple of cars, uh, or a car every couple of seconds in the U.S. It's by far the most complex industrial undertaking in the history of the world. It's the world's biggest industry in a lot of ways, and 
fueled by the second biggest or the other way around, depending on how you count it. Uh, but this industry is not only enormously complex so that a small division has 10,000 people, uh, it, ha it has very peculiar behaviors. Working in about 30 sectors, I get to contrast it with others that we work in. For example, in the auto business, they count cost per pound or cost per part, but nobody buys cars by the pound or by the part. They buy them by the car, right? Uh, and they, they base strategic decisions on accounting, not economic criteria. That is, they, t they treat sunk costs as unamortized assets, as if it were better to write off obsolete capabilities and assets later when you haven't a company than now when you do. This seems to be very odd. Uh, and these attitudes are so ingrained that it's hard to break. It takes the kind of leadership that Alan Mulally is bringing to Ford. But as I go around the auto companies, I've been doing this now for 17 years as a kind of cultural repairman around the world. The technical people in powertrain, body, materials, manufacturing, every branch of the car company typically tell me, tell the boss when you get to the head office this afternoon that we have in this company every capability and technology he needs to do what you're describing. We've just never asked, been asked to put it together properly. It's like the, the remark by a senior official at Mercedes years ago that General Motors has undoubtedly the best R&D capability in the industry and we're confident they'll never learn to use it effectively. <laughs> I hope that turns out not to be true, but they've got a ways to go. Hey, Mary, my name's Mike Saunders. I'm an engineer here at Singapore. Where does engineering education go? Because what you're talking about is so bluntly obvious. How come we haven't done it? What are we doing wrong? I'll give four technical lectures on Friday, that, and I, I can give you the times afterwards, that might shed some light on this. Uh, they'll, they're on super efficient uh, design for buildings, uh, data centers, process and semiconductor industries, and the electricity industry. And actually, if you go to rmi.org slash Stanford, you'll find my public lectures uh, from a year ago in the Stanford Engineering School on how to tunnel through the cost barrier and make very large energy and resource savings cheaper than small or no savings. That is, how to get expanding, not diminishing returns to investment in efficiency. This is an odd concept to many economists. It, it comes from joint products, getting multiple benefits from single expenditures, or piggybacking on renovations you're doing anyway for another reason. Uh, but it's well established. We've done it lately in 30 billion US dollars worth of projects in, in 29 sectors. And, uh, it, it can be taught. We teach it all the time to our clients. We taught it to the Stanford students. Maybe we should teach it here. Uh, and I think there are, there are superb engineers here, probably the best mechanical engineer for, in the world for efficient HVAC and uh, clean rooms and pumps and fans is in Singapore, but doesn't get much honor in his own country because he didn't just step off an airplane with slides. Uh, so there's, there's plenty of talent here, but I, I think we're not yet doing integrative design. That is, we're still teaching engineers how to optimize components for single benefits rather than whole systems for multiple benefits. And I, I'm, we, we find in our industrial work, we can almost invariably save 30 to 60 percent of the energy and retrofit of supposedly efficient plants, heavy process plants. Uh, with two or three year paybacks, and in new plants, 40 to 90 percent savings with lower capex, cost less to build to do it right. Well, <clears throat> we couldn't do that if they'd been designed properly, and I'm getting quite impatient with having to redesign stuff that wasn't designed right the first time. So we're hatching a plot for the nonviolent overthrow of bad engineering. Uh, it's called 10XE. You'll find it at 10xe.org. Um, and 
if you are or know of uh, a designer who thinks in the way I'll describe on Friday, we would love to work with anybody like that. We're looking for wizard quality whole system design integrators uh, from all engineering disciplines and applications so that we can put their best cases in a high brain Velcro casebook that irreversibly rearranges the designer's metal furniture so they'll never do it the old way again, at least without wincing. And then we, we aim to uh, create demand pull by having CEOs of large companies that buy lots of engineering services and know the value of this approach ring up their favorite deans of engineering and say, sorry, we can't hire your graduates unless you teach them this way because they won't be able to produce the breakthrough results that our competitive success requires. And my dean friends tell me that when they get such a call, they get quite interested in changing the pedagogy before all the existing profs die or retire. So let's talk offline about that. Thanks. Having spent the last several years looking at global energy governance and climate change governance, it is very nice for a change to chair a seminar that does not leave me feeling a sense of despair and instead leaves us all, I think, with a very strong sense of optimism and a sense of direction. So I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking Amory for his lecture. As, uh, as, as, as Raymond Williams remarked, uh, to be truly radical is to make hope possible, not despair convincing.